everybody. We're back um, a week late. We were on a roll for two episodes in a row. That's a record for 2018, and uh, we we promptly uh, failed to continue that streak. Anyway, Greg got Everett, a little course, bold. Ursula Garza, um, who's deigned to grace us with her presence again, finally. Really, let's just make it clear. This is all Ursula's fault that we're late. Uh, she's this just too busy. This is all Ursula's fault that we're even doing it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, that's that's the right way to put it. It's your fault that we're doing this. Not your idea, but your fault. Um, guys, go to healthiq.com slash catalyst, and uh, you can see if you're eligible. Take a little quiz. Uh, if you need better life insurance, um, they will get you better rates because they have the science to back up their claims uh, that healthy people can uh, get insured for less money. So go check it out, healthiq.com slash catalyst. Ursula. Yes. Let's talk about the Olympics real quick. Let's. So, you know, people are seeing the uh, qualification um, system for the next Olympics in Tokyo and are just apparently in disbelief (laughs) because everybody's like, is this real? Is this is this right? This can't be right. We're like, it's in the Washington Post. What do you think? Like it's, it's, um, and I keep putting the link to the IWF website that has the actual qualification system on it. So you can read it yourself. You don't have to keep questioning it. (laughs) And I guess what people don't know is, um, uh, the number, like they don't have a list of the number of positives from these countries to be able to tell. Um, like who is going to be immediately uh, sanctioned and who's not. And there, there's this elongated list and uh, that we see of like five countries that people keep listing. And I'm guessing that these have been um, marked off because you've got more positives from the um, 08 and 12 cases being settled so then there have been some that have been added uh to the original list that even i got that we had created um just a few weeks ago because more cases have been settled so you know when i originally saw this qualification system there were only two countries that had were were over the 20 mark of positive cases, um, Kazakhstan and Azerbaijan. But since then, uh, what, Russia, for Belarus, people who aren't and familiar Armenia. with this, if they have 20 or more, what does that mean? If they them? have 20 or more. So the Olympic qualification process allows normally for a country to uh, qualify up to four men and women um, for each um for their team but okay let's look at the whole system and i'm gonna greg said i have five minutes this is gonna be really hard that's so you're already over it (laughs) so we were up we have we'll have 10 classes oh for like the world championships and and of course we don't know the weight classes yet those will come out in july but there will be seven olympic classes so you have seven olympic classes men seven olympic classes women um There will be 14 per weight class. But the way that they're going to select is that the top eight ranked internationally, one per country will will get an invitation with the person's name on it. So this is invitation by rank uh, in the world. And they're going to use a system called Roby, which is uh, like Sinclair but better than Sinclair because – it relates to the world records in your actual class, not the world record of the super heavyweights. Right. Um, and so using Roby points, they're going to – and some events are going to score higher than other events. So world championships will have precedence over – well, we'll score a 1.1. We'll be a 1.1 multiplier. Uh, silver events will have a 1.05 multiplier and – um, bronze events will have just be a 1.0 multiplier. So, I mean, if you read the system, you'll understand what I'm talking about. Um, if you're into like doing the calculations and stuff, the IWF will have a, a running tally as people compete of those ranking uh, of the rankings. 
Um, what we won't know is which four from each country people, the countries intend to take. So it's going to be a little complicated until we get closer and closer to the games. Um, so if you uh, can qualify four from your country, you get to take four men, four women as a max size team. But if you have more than 10 positives since the beginning of the 2008 Olympic Games that have been recorded, then um, internationally, then you are reduced to two slots for men and two slots for women. If you have had a and these, country, these are just WADA positives, right? These are an international yes, competition. Yes, these are international clear. competition positives, right? Um, so these would be, you know, the, the, the positives that you see on the IWF site, the website itself, right. um, not what's happening within our country, uh, fortunately for us. Um, you know, and our system has been that we try to ensure that we're clean internationally by uh, having a strong uh, NATO or n national anti-doping system. Um, if you have, so if you have more than 10, then you'll be reduced from a potential of having four participants to two participants. If you have more than 20 positives since the beginning of the 2008 Olympics, you are reduced to only having one participant, one uh, male, one female. So I guess two, one male, one female. So the team size is cut in half for those who have 20, um, 10 or more, and goes down to one male, one female for those who've had 20 or more. So it means um, all of these countries like, you know, Kazakhstan, Azerbaijan, Russia, Belarus, Romania, they're already, no, they already know right now that they cannot earn more than one slot at the Olympic Games for 2020. Man, it's just um, too bad that no one let them know before now that they weren't allowed to use drugs. <laughs> point I've it made seems unfair. repeatedly it seems that, unfair to just throw that, this at that, them at the last yeah, that, second yeah, you know? that drugs have always Fuck. been uh, against the rules I've mentioned that repeatedly there are um, the list of countries that I have that are at, at 10 or above are uh, Thailand, Iran, Albania, Moldova India, Ukraine Uzbekistan Romania Bulgaria um, who additionally it looks like had 12 in 2008, but I'm not sure if those were before the Olympic Games or those may have been before the Olympic Games. So I don't know if they go into the count, which means those ones that are in the higher uh, number, the higher range, um, you know, if you're at 16 and you get four more between now and the Olympic Games, now you're in the 20 range. You just lost your, you just lost another spot. Um, and, and then the countries that are close to getting 10 right now, um, Venezuela, uh, North Korea, Turkey, or we're all at eight, according to the numbers that I have. Um, and of course these were, uh, n numbers that we had had a f uh, about a month ago. Um, when we first were looking at the system, um, Argentina, Iraq are at seven, uh, Egypt, Georgia, Malaysia, Mexico, Nigeria, Syria were all at six. Uh, Afghanistan, Poland, Taipei, Mongolia, Yemen. No, Taipei were all at five. Mongolia, Yemen, China, Hungary, Tunisia, Chile were all at four. Um, it, and then below that, we're looking at three and below. Um, I mean, we have two. So, yeah, I mean, it seems shocking to um, to a lot of, of people that it's it's tightening up but I think the warning signs were out there I mean we've said we're gonna we have to eliminate drug use in the sport that that's a goal and that particularly we have to focus on cleaning up the Olympic Games and uh, this is uh, one of the ways to do it. The other um, uh, a really sh like strict parameter that is created in the system is to re uh, require that athletes compete in 
twice in, or at least six times over an 18 month period leading up to the games. And, you know, we, we were typically saying twice um, per six month period, but um, it really can be, it's really six times over that uh, 18 month period. And that's just but to they ensure have to, they're actually exposed to drug testing. That's right. Um, and the, the, because the IWF requires that they're in the, I, uh, the international registered testing pool two months before they compete at an international competition, in that six month period, you would know that they would have to be in that drug testing pool two months uh, before they compete. And, you know, ideally we'd have them uh, do two competitions in each period. Um, I mean, if they try to leave it, but they have to compete in each period uh, and six times overall. So they can't just try to show up in the last six month period and try to compete six times and do it that way. They have to compete in each six month period. And because you have different level of events, they're required to compete in a certain number of gold events and silver events. Um, and I can't, I don't have my glasses, so I can't read it all. And I didn't memorize it yet. Um, so I wish I had Phil. See, I'm sure he hasn't memorized. Uh, so you have gold level events, which are the IWF World Championships and Continental Championships. Uh, unfortunately, our Pan Am Games is a silver level event as of now because um, it's a multi-sport game. So existing IW events, multi-sport games, and championships are silver level, and then the bronze or, bronze or other international championships. You can't um, – and you have to compete – and in a variety of these uh, events, you can't just show up to a whole bunch of, of bronze level events. You have to compete in both gold and silver events as well. Um, so that means that you're going to have to go to the world championships and or continental events at some point. Um, and, and I never got to the whole, you know, like who's going to get to go, but you're going to have, um, you know, the top eight by Roby points from the ranking system for the seven weight categories for the men and women get an invitation to compete in the games. And then the winners of the continental championships, the five continental championships for each weight class, um, which will round out the next five uh, competitors in that class. Uh, it, of course, they'll pull out people who are already qualified if they're in front of you. So you could get second, you could be second in your weight class at the, at the Pan Am uh, championships, and if the guy in front of you already has a spot, then you become the the representative from your Pan, from the Pan American Continent Continental Championships. Um, and so, I mean, that's another way to get uh, an invitation. And of course, that that'll be for Asia and Africa and Oceania, and Europe. Um, and who did I forget? Pan Am. Did I say Pan Am? Um, so for the five uh, continental regions. And then um, our championships that we, we currently hold. Uh, and then the, the other ones will be the tripartite invitation. Um, so a maximum of one invita invitation slot by medal event may be issued based on uh, the principle of university, university, uh, universality. So to you know, round it out so that you have representation from all, all of the world. And that's how they'll decide – the unfortunate fact that oh, I lost I'm probably not going to the Olympics in 2020. I'm sorry, you're not? No, you're not. I would have, but you know, now with these new rules, it's just going to be. Yeah, these new rules just, just put you out. <laughs> I was a shoe in before this. Yeah, and they're going to take um, the top, like the top result from each of the six month period plus the fourth highest result. And that's how they're going to decide your um, your overall score. Mm, I'm trying to see if I can remember anything else. I keep losing you, Greg. You're going out. Am I going out now? Oh, now you're back. Uh, I mean, you think you painted a pretty good picture. The really what it comes down to is the fact that uh, there's actually going to be legitimate consequences now for countries who have had a lot of drug positives. Like the f fines and stuff just don't work. If a country has got lots of money to throw at that stuff, it means absolutely nothing. If you've got a lot of money and a deep talent pool, fines for 
drug sanctions, it, it means jack shit. So eliminating participation in the Olympics is probably about as good of uh, a deterrent as you can get. So it'll be interesting to see how that goes. There's going to be a lot of butt hurt people on the internet coming up, you know, saying how the Olympics doesn't count now because, you know, all these countries aren't represented. And like I said earlier, it's not like they didn't have fair warning. It's not like this is a new rule that you're not allowed to use drugs. So forgive me for not being sympathetic at all. I just can't find it in my heart to give a shit. Uh, you know what I mean? Like, don't, don't, don't feel too sorry for everybody uh, who's getting cut out of the game. They had plenty of chances to square their shit away and chose not to. Yeah, no, um, you know, I, I was sitting there. Um, With, you know, with you know, obviously some of the officials that are, are going to be affected by this. Um, and, you know, there's a sense that the punishment goes on and on and on. And you kind of can't help but feel like they, they just don't get, like, how long clean athletes have been punished. Exactly. Like, clean athletes have not been able to really broach metal stands and break records and, um, you know, win glory and money and recognition that they deserve, uh, because they've been in the shadow of, of all of the athletes that we are now realizing if you didn't realize already, um, have been doping. And so if, if, you know, for for the number of, of decades that I've been in the sport that I've seen this continue, it's it's hard to generate, um, I mean, a lot or any sympathy for for the for the athletes. I mean, you realize that everybody's training hard, but you you just weren't doing it by the rules. Like, what do you want us to do for you now? Like, you broke the rules. Now you put us all in jeopardy. You put us all in jeopardy. Um, even the people that were doing, were training hard and doing it right. And and it's a, I'm sure a lot harder to train clean than it must be to train dirty. It looks like. Um, so, yeah, it's you know, how do you explain it to, to people who feel like it, somehow they were justified um, in doing what they did? You don't. Um, <laughs> Yeah. If yeah, if it yeah. if it were as simple as just explaining it to them, then we wouldn't have to have these kind of consequences for breaking the rules. You'd just be like, "Hey, I'm just going to reason with you. This is why you can't use drugs." And they would say, "Oh, I never thought of it that way. I'll stop." Clearly yeah. that doesn't work. Yeah, and and there have, there have been like so far no deterrents have worked. And there's a part of me that's even scared that, you know, we, we really cannot have any positives out of the 2020 Olympic Games. Not a single one. Not one. We cannot afford a single positive out of the Olympic Games. It's just, it would be a huge blight and it would put the whole sport in jeopardy again. And... um I can't say means, I'm super confident that there are going to be well, zero positive well, tests. Well, but there needs to be, and that has to be the goal. That has to be the goal. Like, anybody who is not clean needs to get caught before we get there. And that's, I think, how we handle it in the United States. Like, the intent is to try to catch anybody before they even step foot on an international platform because we don't want the, the, the dirty mark on our name. And that's how the sport needs to approach it. Right. Where <laughs> in a lot of cases, it's kind of the opposite, where if a country does internal testing, it's more just to like make sure they can clear uh, an international test rather than making sure that they're actually clean, if that makes sense. Okay. Can we move on? We can. I did find where it? they have. You what? Uh, I did find this over here. Uh, where they had the number of silver and gold events that you have to do. I would I would recommend to anyone to go to, if you're interested in knowing more about it, go to the IWF website. 
Uh, they have uh, the Tokyo 2020 qualification process. Uh, I have it on my Facebook. I think I've I posted it and um, just follow the link and it'll take you to the whole qualifying system. This is a document of about eight pages or so, maybe six. I can't read this because I have terrible vision without my glasses. And um, you can print it out and peruse it all you want and know everything about the qualifi uh, qualification process. Uh, you still won't know what Roby points are, but <laughs> we'll, we'll, you know, that'll be a whole, a whole new education process in and of itself. But for all these people that are in utter disbelief, um, believe it. It's, I mean, the, the intent is there and the steps to follow suit are, are in place. And I, I don't think this is the end. Like, hopefully more is coming um, in the way of, of ensuring that the sport cleans up. Um, it, this just, it's where we're at in our history, and it's how we have to proceed. Whether people uh, or people other countries are on board or not, they're either going to have to get on board or get off the ship. Well, yeah, it sounds like they're going to be escorted off the ship. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if they don't decide to get with the program. Push off a plank. Yeah, exactly. I'm going to get keel hauled actually coming up here pretty soon. All right. Let's uh All right, let's yeah, see if we can help questions. Lucas. I'm guessing that there are probably not a, a majority of our listeners who are uh inbound to the 2020 Olympics. Nothing personal, guys, but uh we'll get to some stuff that's a little more helpful for you. Uh, Lucas says, I'm offended. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There'll be someone who writes me an email. Like, what the fuck? I'm going I'm to the Olympics. Offended. Okay. Well, you know what? I'm your biggest fan. Keep hashtagging Tokyo 2020 and you'll get there. <laughs> <laughs> That's how you get there, Greg. Oh, uh, I, I guess so. That's all you guys all you have to do. Okay. Uh, Lucas says, your podcast is awesome, not only for its informative value, but also because of its laid-back format of either Greg and Ursula ranting on a bunch of topics. Wow, we made this uh, intro pretty damn laid-back and a little bit ranty, didn't we? Perfect. Just for you, <laughs> Lucas. Uh, I own and it's coach... It's like he's Nostradamus or something. Yeah. <laughs> or he's listened to one or two episodes before. <laughs> or all. It's a pretty clear Probably. pattern. Uh, I own and coach at a CrossFit gym in Brazil. Questions concerning the jerk. How do you balance training the push jerk and the split jerk? Would you only start working on the split jerk after the proper hip drive and push dynamics have been consolidated on the push jerk? One of my intermediate athletes does not feel comfortable in the split jerk and does much better in the push, almost squat jerk. Is the split jerk something you as a coach insist on? Ursula, just, just kick this one off. Um, I'm tired of going first. So I, I had this question in a course that I was just teaching. Um, in terms of like, do I insist on the split jerk? The answer is yes. Initially, yes, because I, this idea that you're going to be a better squat jerker or power jerker than you are, or that you're going to be able to squat jerk or power jerk more than you can split jerk is usually wrong. Um, of course, you feel like that at the beginning because you don't know how to split jerk yet. I would say for this person who's, of course, you're like power jerking is, is a little simpler because people don't have the coordination right off the bat to put their feet into the split. It's not usually comfortable for any of us. Um, when we first learn, it's a, it's a learned skill, like where your feet go and, and how, and getting them there quickly. Um, but I would, as I'm learning drive mechanics, uh, and the, and the bar trajectory for the, for the dip and drive, I would simultaneously be working on foot position and getting comfort in that split position. So doing things like presses in the split, um, different versions of the jerk balance. Um, and, and Greg and I have different names for those exercises, but they're all basically the same, which is getting your feet in the split position and get or, or um, doing different exercises where your feet are moving into the split position with, with lower loads um, or sl more slowly. Um, so I would work on comfort in the split position and then you can work on the actual dip and drive and receiving of the bar and the power jerk um, simultaneously and then try to fuse the two uh, once you have some comfort and the person's able to find that split so um, I, I will 
fairly quickly get people into that split position and ha start having them do different exercises with their legs in that split just to get them comfortable in the split position, even if they're not necessarily doing a split jerk yet. That's yeah. my answer. Okay. Well, I, I largely agree with that. I, but I, the only difference I would say is that I, I insist on, on people learning the split jerk, new athletes learning the split jerk. So I agree there long term. I don't insist that everybody does a split jerk. If you can <laughs> prove that you're better mm -hmm. at a power jerk yeah. or a squat jerk, even yeah. less likely, yeah, then I'm all for it. I'll help you get as good as possible. But I have yet yeah, I have to really one. come across those people because there's so few and far between. Yeah. I've had a couple of them try to convince me that they would be better power jerkers and I've argued with them and then I've allowed no, them to just, experiment yeah. and they all yeah. come to the conclusion Fail. that I was right. Yeah. yeah, sure. You just let them fail. No, I have one. <laughs> I have one that uh, Niblet, Chris Nevels, he's a power jerker. and But, you know, within a, a six weeks, it was clear no. And, but he had been split jerking for a few years. Right. He'd, had, like, he'd had the chance to actually try to right. master the split jerk. Yeah. And it was holding him back. Like we, it was clear that this was, he just, it was the timing. And he had really long legs, really long arms, short torso. We had taken a wider grip. We had shortened the stance. We had done all the, the, tip, the things that you would typically do for his body type. And then, um, and he was really fast twitch, uh, really high jumper, kind of weak in terms of, you know, strength relative to speed. And um, he was like, I think that I, I want to, can I try power jerk? And I said, yeah, this was like in the beginning of a February. By the end of March, he had exceeded his best split jerk by like 15 kilos. Yeah, It was clear. Jerker. Yeah, it was clear. And then I kind of felt like an asshole for making him split jerk all that time. But, you you know, you don't know what you don't know at the moment. Well. And, but I've had another kid that was like, I want to squat jerk because he had squat jerked 170 but his best split jerk was like a double with 180 yeah, i was like okay you moron at all. yeah maybe let's double check the uh, math there well but he thought like if i keep squat jerking more then i'm gonna surpass that and i was like okay but whatever. there's no like, evidence that actually arguing. suggests no, that it doesn't fine. make sense no but but you just let them find out for themselves right and so that lasted i think one week yeah. And his yeah, and then he was he was back to split jerking. So, so I mean, yeah, they, they usually come back around fairly quickly if it's not if it doesn't work. I think people, rather than having to try to learn split jerk because it's a big pain, want to just throw in the towel and come up with something else. It's like people who want to not stick to a program or change, not stick with a coach. Like people just get impatient. We do and get the, that it, question a ton, which is basically like. Please give me, uh, please validate my desire to quit split jerking. Yeah. Like I get that email once a week. Like how, how do I know I need to stop split jerking? The, the answer is almost always that you need to get better at split jerking. Mm -hmm. But so you need to do it more, not less. Right. But circling back, um, when I, if I teach someone, you know, from day one, I do teach them a push press, or excuse me, a power jerk before a split jerk. I teach them a push press even before the power jerk. So I do take that in, you know, that's those steps because obviously, uh, like Ursula was saying, the split footwork is something very unique to the jerk in weightlifting. You you don't ever use that stance, you know, anything else you're doing in the sport. Um, so it can get tricky. So I'd rather focus on, you know, the really fundamental mechanics of the jerk motion and then add the split for footwork in afterwards. Um, and of course the, the power jerk and the push press really reinforce that, uh, the verticality of that dip and drive. Whereas if uh, I think really early on, if you try to teach the split jerk straight out of the gate with someone who doesn't have any experience with push press, um, in particular or power jerk, you end up pretty commonly getting um, a forward drive and people will just like leap like gazelles into a split position. Yeah. Um, and so doing that step-by-step -step push press to power jerk to split jerk, I think it's a good way to kind of avoid that problem right from the start. Um, but going back to what you were saying is, well, you never really know until you try it. I do really like using power jerks or push jerks, depending on the athlete in training, um, regularly 
Uh, and so number one, because it's really helpful, but number two, the point I'm getting at is if you are doing power jerks regularly uh, as a split jerker, you do have a chance to get that regular exposure, to get good at them, and you will see if suddenly, uh, you know, you'll discover pretty easily if you are um, kind of better suited for a power jerk or a push jerk versus a split jerk. It should be fairly obvious, like Ursula said. It shouldn't be something where you have to, you know, do a year of research and experimentation. If it takes that long, then you're just fooling yourself. Um I so a few years ago I I partially tore a hip flexor and so I couldn't split jerk anymore. Uh and so I was like, well, I have nationals in a couple months, so I guess I better learn how to power jerk really well. And so in 2 months I actually got my power jerk up about 15 kilos to match my all-time best split jerk, but it was basically cuz I was forced to. And had I done all the things in my split jerk that got me better at the power jerk, I would have gotten my split jerk higher than it had been, right? Well, because, that's a reason to train power jerk too. Right. Yeah, we because train power it, jerk as long yeah. as well as split jerk, obviously. It, it forces you to drive higher. It forces you to yeah. time it better. It forces you to stay balanced and position the bar better. So it, it is a really useful exercise, but just because you use it in training um, and are decent at it doesn't mean that you're necessarily going to be better at power jerking than split jerking. Um so I think we kind of covered his first two. Yeah. Qu- well, how do you balance I'm training push jerk and split jerk? I, I would say like if you're kind of like a two to one ratio, maybe. So if you're jerking, split jerking twice a week, maybe you're power jerking once a week. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd say it was a pretty reasonable thing. So like a lot of times um, we'll do specific jerk, we'll do clean and jerk, and then maybe I'll have a day where it's power jerk or power clean plus power jerk, something like that. So we get it in there pretty regularly with most of my lifters. Um as, as, so the, his last question, though, you kind of already talked about this. Athlete doesn't feel comfortable in the split. Well, does she feel uncomfortable in the split because she simply hasn't had enough exposure in practice? Or has she been split jerking for five years and just cannot make it work? Because those are two really different things. Mm-hmm. Everybody's uncomfortable in a split initially. Well, not everybody, but 99% of people are. Um and so there and maybe are a, she hasn't found the, the proper grip width and positioning for the split. Well, it, that's the thing is maybe her yeah. split is really bad because no offense, Lucas, maybe she hasn't been ins- instructed in a proper split position because we see all kinds of really odd interpretations of a split position. Um, anything from, you know, really, really narrow uh, to really, really wide to, you know, the back toe is turned out, the back knee is locked or it's bent way too much. Uh, you know, the the front shin is inclined forward 30 degrees, you know, all kinds of goofy stuff where you look at it and you're like, well, yeah, no kidding, you feel uncomfortable. You're in an awful position. Um, and then you, you know, you square someone away and you teach them how to do it and suddenly like, oh, okay, this doesn't feel so awful. Um, And so like Ursula said, there are a lot of exercises that can train that split position directly without just doing split jerks where there's so much other things to worry about. Um, You know, a step to split, a walk to split, a jump to split, a drop to split, um, you know, jerk behind the neck from split position. um, You sound like Bubba Gump. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Uh, Boiled split position, fried split position. (laughs) So, I mean, there are a million things you can do that allow you to really focus on that position, strengthen it, get comfortable, get balanced, so that when you are actually doing a split jerk, it's not something that you're failing to do properly. It's not something you have to overthink. And suddenly the split jerk becomes um, much less of a problem for you. So, I guess I guess what we would agree on is that we don't insist for the rest of your life you have to be be a split jerker it's possible you could be a power jerker or a squat jerker it's just very unlikely there's a reason that when you watch the world championships you know the split jerkers far outnumber the other styles that's not just because every coach in the world is a dickhead and makes all their athletes do split jerks because they just like that's just how it's supposed to be done 
Um, it, there's, it, it's, it offers so many benefits. You have a much broader base for stability. It's easier to recover from a very low position. You have a huge margin for error in that overhead position. I mean, how many jerks have you seen that get pushed six inches forward and the athlete still finds a way uh, you know, to kind of scoot under it? You can't do that stuff with a power jerk and especially not with a squat jerk. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's good reason that it's, it's, it's by far the most prevalent form of jerk. Um, so anyway, getting back to what I was trying to say before I just forgot what I was saying, I think what we'd agree on is that you you have to make sure that you learn and train the split jerk properly for a long enough period of time um, that you know you're going to know: Am I just not practiced enough in this lift, or am I just not suited for it? And prior to that point, you just can't make that decision reasonably. Yeah, I, I would be um, really reticent to try to switch an athlete to a a squat jerk. I would just be reticent. I'm not saying don't ever do it or I would never do it. I would just be very uh, conservative and um, not, uh, I I would have to be really convinced. It would take a lot to convince me. And the one athlete that I like that moved to a power jerk it was it was pretty obvious within a couple of weeks that he was going to outpower jerk when he could split. Just the timing of it was so much better. Yeah. And it did get to a point where we, we you know, there was a diminishing um, return on it where he, he just couldn't get any deeper. Like he wasn't going to be able to squat jerk. Um, like the pre- precision and accuracy that it required over, you know, over and over and over, and the strength of the upper back to recover from a clean. So if you come out of a grinder on a clean, um, coming out of a, a the overhead position, uh, yeah. it's going to yeah, be unlikely. A, do a jerk grip overhead squat, likely from a dead stop after doing a maximal effort clean. Mm-hmm. That's a, that's an unusual really individual who can do that well. Yeah. yeah. And so. you pretty much, you, you're going to need to have short limbs. The, a squat yes. jerk is not a yeah. long limbed person's, yeah. uh, it's not a good idea for you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, let's see here. Zachary. Hey guys. So I've noticed in my snatch, I can easily pull slash high pull a much higher amount than I can snatch. I can also snatch balance about 20 to 25 kilos more than I snatch an overhead squat close to 50 kilos more. Holy crap. Uh, would you say this is more of a major technical issue or a confidence issue? I'd say you probably have every possible snatch issue you can have because that's a huge disparity and all that stuff. It doesn't say it's, it's hard to say two people say, well, I can pull so much more than I snatch. It's hard to really know what that means. Um, I mean, I can pull a lot more than I can snatch, but certainly not high enough to get under it. But if he's saying high pull, I mean, if you can high pull, you know, 20 kilos it, over think, your snatch to like the top of your sternum, then there's something weird going on too. I think it's just not, I mean, if the bar isn't moving fast enough, you're never going to be able to get under it. So I think it's, I think it has to do with speed. So he's probably, everything's just moving too slow. He's, he's probably, he can move the bar. Obviously he has strength. I don't think he's, he's developing the acceleration and speed in the movement. And, um, so you need to develop, like, you know, how do you pull off the floor? Do you, is he just ripping off the floor and decelerating as he moves through the rest of the pool? Or is it not accelerating as he moves through the pool? Um, you know, people get hung up on the strength aspect, not realizing that a snatch is, is has to, uh, the bar has to move really, really quickly and take flight in order for you to have the time to get under it. And so, um, you know, we, when we high pull to a stick, one of the things, because I've seen people be able to high pull a good amount of weight to the stick, but the bar's moving too slow. And they're like, oh, well, if you can get it to the stick, you can get under it. And I'm like, that bar's not moving fast enough for anybody to get under it. <laughs> so if the speed component's missing, then it doesn't really matter how high you can pull it. You're not going to be able to get the bar to stay there to be able to pull yourself under. So I think that's a problem. That is very likely a problem, but I think there's a whole range of potential technical issues too. So you have your pulling strength, you have your overhead strength. We know that. Um, 
but there's a lot going on, you know, between those two, two spots. I mean, I don't even know where to begin. You could be, uh, you know, pulling on your toes the whole time. You could be pulling on your heels the whole time. You could be banging the bar off your hips and swinging it 18 inches forward. You could be hitching. You could be, uh, you know, like there's literally an infinite number of things that you could be doing wrong um, to prevent you from snatching kind of commensurately to your, your strength. Uh, so it, it's kind of a tough question, but I mean, his question is, would you say this is a major technical issue or a confidence issue? I'd say it's a technical issue and I, but I would kind of lump speed in there with that. Yeah. Right. Um, it, because it, there's no, it, if you could overhead squat 50 kilos more than your snatch, I don't see how that can possibly be a confidence issue. Like you would, you would be the most timid athlete to have ever been born. Um, like I, I can't snatch. I can't, I, I couldn't overhead squat more than I could snatch for pretty much the whole time I was lifting. And then I overhead squatted more than I snatched one time and then never really got close to it again. I couldn't snatch balance within 15 kilos of my best snatch. So I feel like if I had that much of a, a margin, oh my God, man, I'd be the most confident snatcher on earth. <laughs> so, yeah, I, 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 mean, you I, look I at think it, your confidence I, has got to be fine. Thing, yeah. I think the one thing that, I mean, obviously for me, speed was the first thing that I thought because I can see someone doing these pulls and, and uh, you know, uh, that it's the, the pull enders, obviously, there's some issue with the turnover, the pull under. Um that, I mean, that's blaring in terms of the technical aspect. But I wonder if his mobility and balance are really all that it's chalked up to be in terms of if the snatch balance is really showing that. Because he may just catch them really high and then write them down. Maybe it's not the kind of snatch balance where he catches it like in a half squat and or, you know, closer to the middle of the receiving position of the snatch. It's hard to know. His overhead squat's 50 kilos more than that. So it seems like he probably... I'm wondering how he gets that overhead squat over his head before he does. Well, I mean, I assume he jerks it. Right, but it's, well, it, what, a wide grip jerk behind the neck? I see, I never even saw that until CrossFit came along because nobody cared. Yeah, it's, um, it's a snatch grip power jerk behind the neck. Yeah, but nobody did that before. <laughs> no, so nobody ever did it. Well, I mean, nobody cared about, like, how much you could just flat out overhead squat. Yeah. Um, but I, I'm, I'm, Wondering if how, how good his actual mobility and balance are in the hole, and if that whole pull under um, has issues in and of itself. Well, I mean, maybe, exactly, no. but exactly, he no. might have limited mobility in terms of squat depth. But it, to me, in in this context, that shouldn't really make that much of a difference because he what I mean to whatever depth he's overhead squatting, it's fifty kilos more than he's snatching. So it. He, Assuming he's snatching no, I'm just saying, to like, the same maximal get, depth as he's quick, squatting, quickly, it shouldn't make a difference. Under the bar, like if there's not enough speed and he can't pull under quickly because he doesn't have good mobility to get into the like a deep into the hole. Oh yeah, then sure. Then he's just like you know, the bar's not moving fast enough. You don't have the mobility. You doesn't matter how high you pull it. You're Trying not going to get under. Snatch everything. Mm-hmm. So well, I Zachary. mean. Basically, what Zachary. we just did was talk for a few minutes and not answer your question. Well, we've no, I, some I take that back. We did. It is. It's a major technical issue slash speed issue. <laughs> mm -hmm. I guess we could. That could have just been uh, a really short answer, but we don't think you're a head case, Zachary. We no, think you have. I, I don't think it's a confidence issue. It, it would. It would shock me if you. It was a confidence issue. Although now you're going to overthink it and it's going to become a confidence issue. <laughs> All right, let's move on to Abby before we say the same thing another 20 times. Uh, Abby says, thanks for the podcast and everything you do for the sport. I have a question regarding my jerk. When the weight starts to get in my upward heavy range, 95% plus, on many of my jerks, my back foot won't stay put. My toe almost slips out of position and my foot collapses inward towards the center of my body. Hold I assume on. she means it's like spinning backward. Or like the heel is spinning in. 
This shift in my foot causes okay. a dip, disruption in the receive uh, receipt of the bar that often leads to a press out or makes me shift the majority of my weight to my front leg to try to yeah, save the jerk. I, I can't tell if I'm over splitting, if it's an ankle mobility issue or what. Bars in front. It doesn't happen in lower percentages and my jerks feel solid and snappy there, so I'm not sure how to address the issue. Any thoughts or insights would be greatly appreciated. Wish I could attach video. The first thing I would say on this is it 95% plus that's where all your lifts are going to get worse uh, and more difficult. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's not so shocking. So driving the bar forward. But yeah, it, it does sound, and it's interesting because she says, sometimes it causes me to shift all my weight onto my front foot. It sounds like mm -hmm. most of your weight's already on your front foot. Um, because yeah. if you were, if you were more slipping. equally balanced, if you had you know about 50% of your weight on your back foot, it wouldn't move that easily. Um. Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's, you, you would be stuck to the floor a lot better. Yeah. Anytime somebody's back foot slips and they come to me with shit like, oh, my foot slipped. It's like, it was in front. Get, get out of here with that. Yeah. Um, you didn't miss it because your foot slipped. You, it was in front. Your foot slipped because it was in front. Like that's <laughs> right. why your back foot goes out. Uh, because there's too much pressure and it shoots the back foot out. So, yeah, they, I mean, they're just in front. Um, you need to maybe uh, work on jerk drives and and dips to make sure that you're driving straight um make sure you're not using your arms and pushing the bar forward make sure you're not anticipating the split and starting to push to your toe as you drive the bar causing you to be a little bit in front when you split the the two legs uh and you're distributing weight on both legs when you land yeah so yeah, i just fix it abby I, there, seriously abby uh, sort yourself out. But so hard, it's just ninety five percent plus. <laughs> Go. So we already so we talked about a bunch you of read that heavy range. I was like eighty five percent plus. Yeah. But ninety five percent. Anytime I go for a PR, it's really hard. Oh, you don't say. <laughs> um. So a bunch of that the split stuff that I mentioned earlier would be good for you here. So, uh, in particular, uh, jerk balance, or I think Ursula, you call it like a jerk balance with a step. Yeah. So basically, you know, start in about two thirds of your split length with the bar racked on your shoulders like a jerk. Dip, drive the bar straight up and then step only your front foot forward into your full split position so your back foot stays planted. Um, because I can imagine, and Ursula, I think you probably started to kind of say this, but I can imagine that you are overlifting and overreaching your back foot and you're actually leaning forward into that split so your front foot is hitting really early, really close, and your back foot is still in the air and then pushing too far backwards. So you need to work on, if you watch in slow motion, that back foot ideally should hit a, a millisecond before the front foot in a split jerk. Um, it should feel at least like they hit at the same time. If it feels like your back foot hits before the front foot in, in real time, it's probably way too uh, severe of a stagger right there. So it, sh it should look and feel in real time like they're hitting together. Um, but if, you're, if your front foot is landing first, all of your weight's going to go on it. Your hips and your back leg are going to go too far behind you. So that puts the bar in front of your, your hips, like Ursula was saying, which means it's going to exacerbate the problem. You're going to slide on that back foot or spin it, whatever's going on. Um, so that jerk balance... Um, Basically doing anything that puts you in a split position and forces you or allows you to train being in a 50-50 balanced position. Uh, so uh, split jerk behind the neck in split. So you start in your split position, you dip, you drive, your feet come off the ground, you land again in that same split position and you land perfectly balanced. Um, you can do a, a what I call, confusingly enough, a push jerk behind the neck in split and the only difference between those two is that in the push jerk your your feet are staying planted on the ground so that's a good way to start because it's it's easier it's less complicated it's easier to maintain your balance and kind of feel that connection um and then you know pretty much all of your your jerk a split jerk work hold that split position for a few seconds on all of your jerks correct your balance correct your position and hold it so that you accumulate a lot of time and experience in that position. You get strong, you get stable, you get confident. Um, 
And then a final thought would be on that back foot. Usually if your your back foot is spinning in, aside from it not having enough weight on it because you're too heavy on the front foot, it's usually because the back foot is already, the toes are already turned out a little bit. Um, I want to see that back heel turned out slightly. So in other words, if you're looking from behind someone in a split position, that back leg comes out from the hip at an angle. I want the that back foot in line with the lower leg. And for that to be possible, that toe has to be turned in, the heel turned out a little bit. Um, so basically, you if that foot is straight forward and the, the, the leg is angling in, you're already setting yourself up for the foot to spin or the ankle to roll. You want to be able to push straight down on the balls of your feet uh, so that your ankle hinges in that position. And that way you can actually put that 50% of your weight on it without it getting all crazy. I think Bob Ticano called that poo foot. Where the back foot spins, you know, like you're walking and you just stepped in a in a pile of dog shit and slid a little bit. It's actually such an ingenious uh, term for it because it's number one, it's funny, but number two, it's just so accurate. Um, I have so the name quit for like when you hit your jerk. heel and you when when the fr- when the front of the foot doesn't touch the ground and people like uh, fishtail or like with the front of the foot. They, they hit with the toe and they don't put the heel down. Oh yeah. And their heel swivels on the front. I'll call that a fish tail. Yeah. But I've never, I've never named the back foot, but poo foot will do. Poo foot will do. Uh, so I think. And shit. That's all. You, <laughs> well, Bob. you know, don't do it. <laughs> Leave it to Bob. Come up with something related to biological material. Right. Yeah, exactly. Well, he was a biology teacher. So there you go. Uh, did we cover that one? Did well, we leave uh, Abby I, hanging, I or is that good? So you know, like all the stuff you were giving her was giving her a method for really feeling, like finding the center of mass and feeling the back leg. I would add to that because um, if you're doing it with the heavier weights, one of the things that it's telling me is that you're, you know, you're either driving them forward or you're pushing them forward, or um, there may be a little bit of reticence of like getting under that bar. So um, that's apparently the word for the day reticent um (laughs) could you tell what lord i what word i learned today greg no um is jerk recovery like you might want to do some jerk recoveries at 105 percent so that you get used to bearing the 100 the 95 percent overhead without freaking out and throwing it forward um but i would do the jerk recoveries not the ones that you just put your legs down and do the recovery but actually standing uh with your brow at the bar on the balls of your feet and then doing the split and then recovering so that you're working on splitting under the bar, landing both feet securely before you recover. So I would, I would um, throw in some, some jerk recoveries. I mean, if you do all that shit, you're going to be a jerk master. There you go. <laughs> of course, you're not going to have time to snatch because Greg and I just gave you a prescription <laughs> to basically jerk every day all day. No. Yeah. Six hours a week on jerk. <laughs> just the split position. Oh, boy. All right. Well, let's wrap it up there. Ursula's got a tight okay. schedule. That's a good one. We gave oh, you guys probably. plenty of stuff to work on. Um, if you still listen to this podcast... I, I know it's so easy to forget that we exist when we put these things out every three to four weeks. It's actually really ridiculous. Um, We're working on it. I'm working on it, Greg. I'm going to get it together. April's my good month. Oh, boy. Okay, so maybe we'll be on schedule for two episodes in April, and then then it'll be May, (laughs) which apparently is not a good month. I have um I have some things I want to say, though. People are already hanging up. Y'all just go ahead and hang up. They're like, we hate her. Yeah. Um. I, I have an art of coaching weightlifting coming up. I prefer a weightlifting in um, Houston. It's April t- this weekend. No, April not this weekend. The next weekend. Oh, this coming weekend. When are you putting this thing out today? Good. If it's this weekend, you're out of luck. No, but when is it today? When are you putting it out today? You're Friday the thirteenth. It'll come out Tuesday. Oh, Tuesday. It's coming out this, the the seventeenth. So it'll be the weekend um, after that. So the twentieth and the twenty first. So there's still time to register for it. There you go. Um, and then I'm going to Oregon to see Greg. And then while I'm there, I'm going to do a, a, a course 
also in what did we decide it's at in Eugene? Um, <laughs> a spring, uh, Springfield? No, not Springfield. Yeah, Springfield. Yeah, Springfield. Yeah, it's in Springfield. Um, and that's uh, in June twenty uh, second through the twenty fourth. And then I'm going to be in San Diego, um, and I'm not sure if I have the dates pinned down, but it, it looks like August at the end of August. Um, but I'm getting all of uh, the the Oregon course and the the Houston course are on my website at weightliftingwise.com. Um, yeah, and we have uh, of course the the women's camp is in in August. That's coming up. Uh, well, I guess that's kind of far away. That's nowhere near uh, coming up in my uh, scope of well, thinking. But some of us plan before ten minutes ahead of time, Ursula. Oh, you just stop it. Well, I'm flipping through the calendar right now. Uh, the ninth through the thirteenth. I think that's what it is, or that's something like that. The eighth through the twelfth um, in August. Anyways, that's on the USA Weightlifting website. So, um, and Amy and I will be doing it. Amy is. Um, there are two international coaches uh, in this country that are women and one senior international coach. That's me. And so Amy is one of the international coaches. And then the senior international coach, that's me, will be coaching there <laughs> along with Aaron and Andika. Uh, and so, yeah, it's going to be uh, in Vegas. So that's going to be a good time. Oh boy. So if you're, if you're looking for stuff to do and you want to learn more about weightlifting, you should join us. Um, I think it's going to be an all-women's camp, so that's going to be a really uh, interesting thing. And, of course, not everybody's happy about it, but I really wanted to bring back um, the ability for the women to meet and develop the camaraderie that we used to have at our women's camps um, that, that really don't exist anymore. Um, and so this is a way for everyone to experience, hopefully, what I really enjoyed as a as an elite athlete, which is just an environment where there you get to be around um, other women that really love weightlifting and you get to share that experience. So of training hard and hanging out and uh, talking about barbells. Yeah. Um, Yeah. I know it's, it's, it's nice to find other people that share the the passion that you have for weightlifting. And so um, hopefully we'll, we'll see some people out there as well. I think that's if, it. If you're a dude and you're butt hurt that you can't go to this thing, you can go to one of Ursula's other seminars that she just told you. You have no excuse. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, she can, I, she gonna, can treat you a like a woman camp. if you prefer. It doesn't really matter to her. I'm not going to have a man camp. Sorry, guys. Um, <laughs> but we are going to have a women's camp. All right. But we'll have, I have a men's team. That, that's not good enough. You know, you just can't win, Greg. I had a men's team. You get people give me shit. I do a women's camp. People give me shit. You it's can't. Just, it's impossible. You can't win. It's I okay. just, just don't listen to what people say anymore. I don't know. I'm, I'm used Unless to it's shit. nice. <laughs> well, I'm still waiting. <laughs> yeah. All right, guys. Thank you for listening. Uh, once a year when this comes out. Uh, oh, please take a minute and go post a, a review and five stars and what have you over on iTunes or Google play or whatever you listen to this thing on. We would appreciate it very much. And, uh, we'll talk to you at some time in the the unspecified near future. All right. See ya. All right. Bye-bye.